I'll, I'll just start. Um, we're being recorded. Here we go. <laughs> I'll just start by uh, giving you a bit of my disclosure information. I've got some current research grants that are through CIHR, um, CABI, and the Briere Center for Learning, Research, and Innovation. Any honorary or travel that I've received has been from nonprofit organizations. And uh, this particular program doesn't have any industry uh, funding support. And as a result, I don't really feel like I have uh, any industry type biases, um, but I will try as much as possible to provide uh, information that is evidence-based where it exists for the frail elderly. So in terms of objectives this afternoon, what uh, I thought would be good to talk about were approaches to appropriate prescribing and deprescribing for older people and to give you some information that will help generate plans to support safety prescribing. And we have just the 20 minutes to go over a lot of this information. So I'm gonna give a lot of highlights, a couple of case examples and provide you with them, some resources for further information. So in terms of background, uh, where I'm coming from, I'm a pharmacist. I've been working, whoops, in the Briere Geriatric, sorry. <laughs> I've been working in the Briere Geriatric Day Hospital now for 22 years. We're an interprofessional program. We have three physicians with care of the elderly training, nursing, social work, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, a psychometrist, and myself. I'm there two days a week. And then I also have a three day a week research position. And a lot of my research um, interests arise really from trying to address the challenges that I see in the day hospital. I'm referred many patients taking 20, 25, 30 plus medications. Um, we often find that when we reduce doses or we stop medications that people feel better. Uh, their cognition improves, their, um, their falls reduce. And, and so it's really convinced me from that experience that, that de-prescribing is, is very important uh, to pursue. Uh, what we commonly see are patients taking a lot of CNS depressant medications and anticholinergic drugs that contribute to cognitive impairment and falls. We see that those signs and symptoms such as those and others are quite often not recognized as, as being potentially caused by a drug. And then other drugs are started to treat those uh, conditions. And quite often drugs seem to have been continued often for many years when the reason um, and effectiveness is unclear. We, we quite often will get referrals from family physicians who've inherited a patient from someone else and they're not quite sure um, why certain medications are being taken. And people are often taking doses that were tolerated when they were younger, uh, but, they, but those doses haven't been reduced as people got older and became more frail. So I, I've done a number of things to try to uh, address these issues. In the 2000s, I worked in Ontario with integrating pharmacists into family health teams, uh, assuming that the pharmacist-physician pair um, is, is able to address these kinds of issues together. Uh, we've also produced a number of case reports from the day hospital with examples of the kind of work that we do in deep prescribing. And I'll give you a, a link to those later in, in the slides. About eight years ago, we got some funding to develop evidence-based deep prescribing guidelines. And yeah, you may be familiar with those from our website, deepprescribing.org. We've also developed an online module for training for polypharmacy and deep prescribing. And I've listed here our Twitter account and our, our website um, for, um, for you to look into uh, after the, the presentation. In terms of uh, definitions, uh, the definition of polypharmacy used to be sort of a certain number of medications. Uh, I, I don't think it's tip necessarily a, a number, but it's really more where medications have been continued, where there's not the evidence for, for a lot of benefit or where there's more harm than benefit. And deep prescribing really, I think, is just part of good prescribing. It's backing off when doses are high or stopping medications that are no longer needed or might be causing harm. And the difference... Um, between deprescribing and, and sort of non-compliance is that deprescribing is a planned and supervised process of dose reduction with monitoring by a healthcare provider to make sure that patients uh, benefit from the process. So uh, I thought it'd be good to start with this notion of uh, principles of prescribing for older people. And I've, I've tried to group them into about six different 
principles to think about. Uh, one is when you're looking at your older, perhaps frail patient is decide if a medication is indicated or still indicated. And you have to answer questions about the effectiveness or the potential effectiveness of the medication, um, whether it's numbers needed to treat or effectiveness in that particular person. You need to think about, is there evidence in this population, frail, older people with multiple morbidities? What's the time to benefit for, in terms of adding a new medication? Are the targets such as blood sugar or blood pressure still appropriate? given this person's level of frailty and their age. You want to choose medications with the least risk of drug interactions and adverse events and that are easy to take. And resources like Rx Files can help you compare medications and side effects. Uh, the CPS can help you decide whether a medication is maybe going to be too large to swallow, whether there's something sublingual that could be taken instead. You want to always use the lowest effective dose, and that is because older people handle and they respond to drugs differently. And uh, I, I go into this in a lot more detail in a presentation that's actually recorded as a webinar on our website that I gave for the College of Family Physicians in December. If you want to know more about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of drugs, you can take a look at that. You also want to inform people about possible side effects of medications and what to do when they occur. And it can be overwhelming, obviously, to give someone a list of hundreds of side effects, but I tend to think about the most important ones. So the kinds of side effects that land people in hospital are um, drugs that lower blood sugar and drugs that cause bleeding. So you want to warn people if that is something that it, you know, could happen with a drug, that that's, they should monitor for that. Falls and confusion is something else that um, people should monitor for, uh, as well as side effects that we know lead to common prescribing cascades, such as ankle edema from a gabapentinoid drug or a calcium channel blocker drug. You also want to consider the potential for any symptom to be caused by a drug. Uh, always asking that question, can this be caused by a drug? Uh, and asking patients about effectiveness and side effects routinely will help to identify problems early on. And the latter two are things that we're trying to train members of the public now to ask those questions more commonly. Can this new problem I have be caused by a drug? And how will I know the medication is working or causing a problem? So, so why deprescribe? Well, people might be having side effects from a dose being too high. Um, they might have added effects with other medications. It might be unclear if the person's responding to a medication. The original reason may not be known. This, this is common uh, for us where the original prescriber uh, is, is unknown or may have passed away and, uh, and the new family physician doesn't have that information about the original reason. Uh, the patient and the healthcare provider are often unable to confirm the effectiveness of a medication, especially again when it's been long term. And quite often we find they're taking multiple medications for the same reason, and it's very unclear which medication is helping or, or if any of them are really helping. So we will often take action in those cases where there's a lack of clarity around the response to try to determine if there is a, a response. And this, uh, this is an example from one of the case reports that we published. And I, I recommend you take a look at these. They're all listed on our website, but they are all written in such a way that they have instructions and worksheets for interprofessional case discussions. So they're very good for um, teaching and learning. Uh, and they're in CMAJ, Canadian Family Physician, and the Canadian Pharmacist Journal. And as I said, they're, they're meant as an interprofessional uh, case discussion. But this particular one demonstrates the combination of CNS depressant type medications, anticholinergic medications, medications that affect the cardiovascular system, all contributing to loss of balance and falls and cognitive impairment and excessive sedation. So, the challenge, of course, is you can identify that all these medications might be contributing to problems, but then how do you actually make a decision about stopping a medication? And that, I think, is what we'll probably get into when we discuss the case um, this afternoon. Because on one hand, you're weighing, if I continue the medication, there might be some benefits. It could improve a sign or symptom. It might reduce the risk of future illness. It might slow the progression of a disease. It might even cure a disease. Um, but the harms are the adverse reactions, drug interactions, potentially worsening frailty, 
um, affecting functional um, status. Uh, the more medications people are prescribed, the less likely they are to take them. And there could be other implications of medication overload, such as cost, for example. So the decision to deprescribe has potentially some benefits. You might reduce numbers of medications or medications that might be considered potentially inappropriate and causing more side effects in older people. You might reduce adverse drug reactions. Some studies actually show that there's a reduction in mortality with deprescribing. Uh, you, in all likelihood, would reduce drug and healthcare costs. Uh, you might improve adherence. In general, deprescribing has found in many studies to be safe, but you do have to monitor and manage adverse drug withdrawal events like the return of a symptom or a withdrawal effect and keeping in mind the potential for reversal of drug interactions, which can affect the dosing and the effect of other medications. So I've got a couple of cases to illustrate how we do this in the day hospital. And the first one was a lady in her 80s who had had an ongoing issue with cognitive impairment and falls for the last several months. And we determined that this could potentially be related to her imipramine, which she had been taking 300 milligrams every night for about 50 years. And when I first saw that dose, I thought, wow, that's, that's high. But that is in fact a maximum dose for, um, for uh, anxiety disorder. This particular patient, thought that it had been started when she had had a case of severe uh, depression in her 30s related to a stressful home situation, which still existed, but was managed a lot better now. And there were other less other types of stressors in her life. She was very, very sedated, this particular lady in a very flat affect. And we uh, at first she said, you know, you're not stopping that drug because I need that to sleep. But over time, we convinced her that it would be worth reducing it to see if it would help with her concentration. Uh, and, and we know that um, imipramine is a highly anticholinergic drug and um, anticholinergic load is, is very predictive of um, cognitive and physical impairment. Uh, it reduces reaction time, uh, attention, memory, uh, narrative recall, and various language tasks. So the risks associated with this type of drugs are very high. So we started by reducing her mipramine. Oh, by the way, she had actually been started on denepazil um, for dementia, which um, was recognized in the consult note that the mipramine could be contributing to that um, diagnosis of dementia, but no attempt had been made to reduce it. So we started to reduce it by 50 milligrams per week. And we monitored basically for rebound effects, which could include nausea, vomiting, sweating, um, increased urination, diarrhea, tachycardia, ecthesia, dystonia. The only symptom that she really noticed over that period of time while we were reducing it was sweating. Um, we did extend that uh, tapering over about eight weeks in total. She had an unrelated short hospital stay in, in the middle of her day hospital um, admission, but she did complete the tapering and, and the imipramine was stopped and she became like a different person. Um, she, she felt better. She was more interactive. She said to me, this is the first time in years I can remember what I was talking about by the end of the sentence. And she stopped having falls. And we referred her then for an assessment to determine if the denepazil was still needed. So uh, what I tried to do for each of these cases include resources. So at the bottom of the slide there, you see there's uh, a website where you can calculate anticholinergic burden. I also highly recommend the RX Files, um, which is the academic detailing organization in Saskatchewan, um, because they have excellent resources on uh, anticholinergic medications. And I've included just a couple of screenshots to show you one of their charts, uh, which you can see actually a mipramine is, where is it? Here in red, uh, listed as being moderate to high anticholinergic activity. And so you can see all the different types of medications that can contribute to this anticholinergic problem. They also have um, a good section on the types of anticholinergic side effects that you might see and tips to deal with those side effects. Uh, and uh, charts that help you determine what you should monitor for during withdrawal. So this cholinergic type rebound symptom and a suggested approach 
for tapering. So their tapering approach is a little bit faster. It's over a couple of weeks um, than we decided to pursue with our patient. And partly that was because the lady had been taking the medication for 50 years at a pretty high dose. And so we, we wanted to go down very slowly and we negotiated that rate of tapering with her and, uh, and she was okay with that. And we were, of course, by the way, monitoring, checking in with her weekly about the progress uh, of this. So for the second case, again, an older man with a, a number of anticholinergic effects, uh, as well as some CNS depressant medications here, all uh, contributing to, um, it, you know, the dry mouth, thirst, hesitancy, dizziness, fatigue, trouble concentrating, falls. This is sort of the typical patient that shows up at the day hospital. And we, over time, uh, and again, they're here for sort of eight to 10 weeks, we tapered his trazodone, mirtazapine, and quetiapine, stopped all three, which he had been taking to help with sleep. And as Dave, David Gardner will talk to you more next week about cognitive behavioral therapy, but we implemented some of those strategies with him. We also lowered the doses of his citalopram and pregabalin. In terms of monitoring, uh, the withdrawal of antidepressants, particularly SSRIs and SNR. SNRIs is associated with a kind of flu-like um, uh, syndrome uh, that includes uh, nausea, some imbalance, uh, some sensory disturbances, some hyperarousal, and this Finnish acronym is helpful to remember that. We also monitored for pain as we reduced the pregabalin and his mood as we reduced the citalopram. So the anticholinergic and CNS depressant effects improved. He was sleeping with no problem. Part of the reason he told us afterwards that he felt he was sleeping better was because his mouth wasn't as dry, so he didn't need to get up as many times during the night to drink. Um, his mood was stable, and there was no difference in his pain despite the pregabalin reduction. So in terms of resources, I tried to find the best resource for medications that cause falls, but it essentially comes down to anything that affects the brain can cause falls. Um, and I was at a great presentation yesterday by Jerry Medris. Um, Dr. Abioni from uh, Toronto spoke about this. And if, if you're interested in, in, a, in an hour's worth of discussion about medications that cause falls, you can uh, touch base with the Jerry Medris group about listening to a recording of that presentation, which I believe is in a couple of weeks. Or medications that affect um, blood pressure, in particular orthostatic hypotension, can also contribute to falls. So in order to find information about the tapering of um, antidepressants, antipsychotics, the quetiapine in this place, gabapentinoids, the pregabalin, and monitoring for at-risk drug withdrawal events. A couple of resources you can check out are medstopper.com and again, Rx Files. And I'm going to show you just the uh, chart from Rx Files, which gives some information about the withdrawal symptoms to expect, and then some specific information for each drug about how quickly you might see uh, withdrawal symptoms happen and how quickly they might resolve. And so that's very helpful for developing a monitoring plan. You'll also um, remember I talked at the beginning of the presentation about the deprescribing guidelines that we've developed. This is an example of one of them and it's for antipsychotic uh, deprescribing for both behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, but also when um, an antipsychotic medication is being taken for primary insomnia. So in this case, quetiapine, 12.5 milligrams was being taken for insomnia. In that particular case, it's at such a low dose that we can simply stop it without tapering uh, and then look at non-drug approaches to sleep management. And then I've also included for if you had a patient with, uh, you know, a different antipsychotic uh, in a much higher dose uh, where you might want to consider the potential for withdrawal symptoms, uh, that this information also is available in Rx files. Um, and here you have the common withdrawal symptoms and a suggested tapering protocol. So uh, there was a number of other resources to help you with deprescribing. Um, our website contains links to the guidelines that I mentioned, as well as to the other uh, deprescribing networks, such as the Canadian Deprescribing Network. We've got some testimonials on our website, in particular in the patient and clinician stories. There's a great testimonial 
um, by a woman who um, discontinued her benzodiazepine over the course of about six months. And she talks about the challenges inherent with that and how she felt afterwards. Uh, and then there are also, as I mentioned, these different deprescribing webinars, including the one that I did in, in December that has a lot more detail than I can really cover in the 20 minutes today. There's also a link to the um, module. And I wanted to point out, uh, because I get asked this a lot, um, how can you tell that a, a problem is being caused by a drug? And I have to say, I, I'm a big fan of Google. But, and when I've Googled, can such and such be caused by a drug, I often end up uh, at the Mayo Clinic or Medline Plus, and they have great resources answering those questions. In um, New South Wales, there's a group that has been starting to develop a series of deep prescribing guides uh, for the topics that are consistent with those we've developed guidelines for. They tend to reference our guidelines, but they presented the material in a little bit uh, of a different way that might be suitable for different patients. And then I also um, highly recommend uh, Jerry Medrisk and eConsult Ontario uh, if you want to, if you have a really complicated patient that you need a more comprehensive consult on. Just a screenshot of our website uh, where you can find our guidelines and algorithms a screenshot of MedStopper where you can input the name of the medication and then it will provide a suggested taper approach and signs to um, symptoms to monitor for while tapering and link you also to the beers and stop criteria which will provide you with the um, uh, references and such for, um, for the, the rationale behind the medication being potentially problematic. And just wanted to highlight here um, for the CPS uh, that they are starting to include a lot of really helpful information around dependence and tolerance, withdrawal, um, how to manage tapering, et cetera. So don't forget that that resource is there for you as well. And uh, there were a couple of questions that the organizers, uh, when we were talking the other day about this presentation that they suggested. One was how to engage people in deprescribing. And so I've included here some of the common phrases that I find really helpful. These ones on the right-hand side in the bottom, medications that were appropriate then may not be as useful now. It's normal practice to reduce doses as people get older. People become more sensitive to side effects as they get older. People handle and they respond to drugs differently as they get older. These are all really helpful for normalizing the deprescribing process for people. And then the two on the top left, I think are, are helpful for personalizing a situation um, for a patient. So instead of treating this drug side effect with another drug, the better option is to see if we can reduce or stop the first drug. Or sometimes risks of a drug, in your case, the risks might outweigh the benefit of this particular drug. And so those are handy phrases. And then the next question was, how do I suggest deprescribing without offending anyone? And so we're a referral uh, consult program. So we are often deprescribing medications that other people have started, whether it's the family doctor or different specialists. And so we have to use the same approaches uh, when we're uh, talking to, to other prescribers. And so our approaches are really to, um, personalize the information, starting with the patient. What's the evidence that there might be harm uh, that's outweighing the benefit? Is the patient even taking the medication? Quite often the original prescriber doesn't know that the patient actually only takes the medication once in a while. Um, make a concrete suggestion and include the concise rationale if it's needed. Um, Sometimes we have found uh, like pharmacists, for example, when they're sending a note to uh, the family doctor, they might include one of the deprescribing algorithms um, and then their specific recommendation. Asking for input um, is a lot better uh, than suggesting somebody has done something wrong. One of the things that's a bit of a pet peeve is when people say, you know, your patient is taking an inappropriate medication. Well, that's, Medications are not inappropriate when they're first prescribed. They're prescribed because somebody thinks that it's going to help the patient. Uh, and so just be, be careful about the wording that, that you use. Obviously signing your name, providing your contact information so people can get back to you and following up. And then we do a lot of empowering the patient to try to help them have these discussions with their prescribers. So I'm gonna just show you three quick examples that you can go back to afterwards and then we'll finish up. 
Um, this is uh, an example of a speedy memo. This is written by one of my physicians who has lovely handwriting. Uh, she's given me permission to share these um, memos with you. And she typically starts these off, uh, and this is how I would, would um, uh, write these as well, but not as neatly. Uh, you know, that the patient forgets her nitro patch, is not having issues with angina during physio and exercise, could we stop it? And you'll see the answer from the, from the prescriber there, yes. Medication compliance is sometimes not optimal to simplify her regimen. Can we switch from apixaban to rivaroxaban? Yes. She often forgets her new Lasix, takes it later when she remembered, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So you can see we've tr we try to word our um, questions so that yes and no answers are all that the prescriber has to write. Um, and then there's a couple of more examples here. So we explain the rationale, why the patient's having their medication review, what we would like to get their input on, here's the situation, we would like to do this. Uh, and then the person writes, I agree. And there's one more example here that you can take a look at. So my, my final plea of, as I finish up my portion of the presentation is uh, to ask you uh, to think about the kinds of information that will help other people or even yourselves down the line make deep prescribing decisions. And the first one is to document the reason for the medication and the initial response. We find, and in the, in the family physicians we talk to find this, that that information is often very difficult to locate. Monitor and document the response on a regular basis so that we know years down the road, is the drug still working? Share that information with the patients and with other healthcare providers. Most patients have no idea why they're taking medications. Uh, no idea if the medication is working. And that's something that I really think we can change. And then I think, um, you know, right now, writing a repeat prescription is the default. That's the automatic. View. What I would like to see switch in the future is that deprescribing is the default. And writing a repeat prescription is a new decision that's being made. So even just thinking of that will help you to think more consciously about when to continue or stop medication. And then I think for a lot of medications, there's an opportunity to talk about an exit plan um, at the very beginning of prescribing. You know, we're starting this sleeping pill now for this particular reason. The exit plan includes this. Um, you know, they don't necessarily need to take this medication forever. Here's the exit plan for how we can eventually reduce it. And so I, I think thinking about those strategies um, early on uh, is helpful as well. And uh, there is one more slide, but it's really just one. I'll quickly show it that gives um, a few websites uh, and um, articles that help to uh, identify effectiveness, effectiveness, potential for harm, uh, time to benefit, and targets. So I am all finished now.